were very strong ideals and very strong uh, opinions about the rights of human beings, um, the, the, the necessity for freedom, uh, freedom from tyranny. I think all of these concepts, and including religious tyranny, by the way, um, I think all of this was part of the movement that created uh, the American Revolution. But I think like anything else, once a society finds itself accepted as part of society, suddenly it becomes entrenched in that society. It takes on some of the worst aspects of that society. Uh, in, in the desire to become all-inclusive, you begin to bring people into your organization who do not hold the same ideals, who are not the same people as when you started. So you suddenly become, it becomes an institution. Like the Catholic Church for 300 years existed underground. It was persecuted. They had to meet at night in catacombs. Suddenly with Constantine, they become a state religion. And within a thousand years, suddenly, you know, the Catholic Church has become this monolithic operation which owns land, which controls governments, which decides who's going to be a king or not. I don't think Jesus in his, you know, wandering through Palestine had this idea in his mind, you know. Yeah. So the same thing with Freemasonry. I think that Freemasonry initially was a movement of resistance against monarchy, resistance against organized religion, resistance against any any group that would try to tell you how to think or how to live. I think that was pure in that, in that case. And I think like the church, with the passage of time, and when it became almost a state function, that's when you saw corruption enter into Freemasonry. That's how you could have a propaganda due in Italy, where you could have fascists and right-wing you know, assassins as Freemasons. I mean, there was no pretense at Masonic ideals anymore, at Enlightenment ideals. It was gone. It was disappeared. We were back to, you know, monarchy concepts. So I think that that's what happened. Freemasonry became sidetracked. I don't say all of it. I think there's a lot of Freemasonic organizations that are, that are still trying to adhere to these ideas. But when you have presidents of the United States who are Freemasons, you naturally start to ask yourself, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Mm. What does that really mean? Yeah. Washington was a Freemason. Our first president was a Freemason. We have no problem with that. But suddenly we have a problem with maybe Gerald Ford being a Freemason. Because of Gerald Ford's you know, associations with other things, we suddenly question his, his membership in Freemasonry. Um, it's a very difficult question, especially as Freemasonry is secret. Um, this is part of the problem. It's the argument I have with Freemasons. As long as you keep your, thing, your, your rituals secret, as long as you maintain secrecy, don't be amazed if people associate you with all sorts of terrible things. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> as I say in my book, you know, uh, people who meet in secret uh, are not benefactors normally. People are not giving you money secretly. You know? yeah. They're not curing your illness secretly. <laughs> if they're meeting in secret, it's usually for something that's dangerous. It's usually for something that you know, we might frown upon yeah, as, yeah. You know, as the rest of society. So don't feel bad if we associate you with trying to control the world or run you know, world governments and all the rest of it. It's your own fault you know, yeah. for being so damn secret. You know? uh, so I said, with, the, with that being said, do you think... They're so, I don't even know if they, if they really want to have their, that monkey off their back, so to speak, because in one way I actually think that that's potentially even an attractor for many people. Like, oh, what is this mystery here? You know, and, and, and as many people know, that, that that is sufficient enough to recruit new members because of the curiosity of what it actually is. So it might actually serve them at the end of the day. But if they would like to have this um, put to rest, do you think that their solution is to open up their doors even more than I have been doing in the last couple of years? That might be a solution. They've certainly had a lot of Freemasons on the air recently. I mean, uh, on the television documentaries, we have many high-ranking Masons and Masonic scholars talking directly to the public about what they do and who they are. They're trying to overcome this negative image. Um, but, you know, I have another take on this, and it, it may be uh, from out of left field, as we say, but I think that privacy has become an issue in, this, in the world we live in today. And it may be a strength of Freemasonry that it is able to maintain secrecy. This may be the only place these days in the United States where you can meet secretly and not be photographed, you know, and not have your what you're saying or what you're doing wind up on Facebook or on Twitter or someplace <laughs> on the Internet. I mean, maybe, maybe this is a strength. Maybe this will be a strength of Freemasonry in the future, that it's off the grid that way. That it's not part of the general, let's let it all hang out, reality show, reality that we live in, um, where everything you say or do is being recorded and transmitted. Um, this may be a strength of Freemasonry. It was, I, think, I think it was a pet, an impediment, an obstacle for them for so long. 
but I think in the next few years, people may look at this and say, maybe this, they have the right idea. You know, they're, they're initiating secretly. Um, they're meeting secretly. We're not allowed to know what's going on. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we all want to be part of this, you know, mm. and we all want to be part of the secret so that we can have some place where we go where we know we're, you know, we're safe. We're, we are private, that there's not a, a drone taking a photograph of us from 80,000 feet. <laughs> With, you know, with so many denominations of secret societies as well, I, I guess one question pertinent to ask here is uh, how, how broad you draw the circle when you, when you say that even the term Mason or, or Freemason, even that can be uh, two different things if you want to be specific. But, I mean, we have Knights of Malta, for instance, that on one hand, the sovereign military order of Knights of Malta, that is on one hand a, a Catholic branch to all of this, but, but if you look at the uh, Freemasonic hierarchy, uh, they have a Knights of Malta level there as well, and 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 we had a uh, a, a Canadian uh, Grand. I, I don't know if he was the Grand Master, but we, he was involved in in one of the Freemasonic lodges of the branches of Knights of Malta on the show, and he said that they even connect at the top anyway. But uh, we, on the other hand, then we have the Illuminati. We have all these different denominations and factions and so forth. And when you say Freemasonry, are you specifically talking about? Uh, those who are officially uh, uh, recognized by the United Grand Lodge, or, or do you, brother, do you draw a, a, a broader circle than that, Peter? A good question. For the most part, when I'm talking about Freemasons, I'm talking about the traditional Freemasons. I'm not talking about Knights of Malta or Templars or Illuminati or anything else, but just the Freemasons. You know, my book is about the Freemasons. However, um, when you say United Grand Lodge, that's I'm broader than that. The United Grand Lodge is is one organization. Um, I also write about co-masonry, uh, which is a form of masonry which is more esoteric and which also allows women to become members. Yes. So I write about that branch of Freemasonry. And Prince Hall Masonry, uh, which was created by uh, former slaves in the United States. So it was a, a largely a black lodge, if you will, uh, because Freemasons uh, did not allow black people to become members for a long time. Uh, they did not allow former slaves to become members because they had a regulation that you had to be born free. You had to be born as a free man to become a Mason. So uh, all those ideals of the Enlightenment didn't extend quite so far as black people, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. or women. So you know there were problems there. So when I talk about mas Masonry, I'm talking about traditional Freemasonry, but United Grand Lodge plus Co-Masonry plus Prince Hall Masonry. I talk about the Illuminati briefly because there's just no way to talk about Freemasons without talking about the Illuminati. But when you talk about the Knights of Malta, for instance, and some of the other groups, you're talking about uh, problem areas, too. I think that perhaps the Knights of Malta may be more problematic even than the Freemasons because of all the political connotations, all the political memberships, including CIA directors and everything else yes, that have been yes. involved with Knights of Malta. Uh, Skull and Bones, famously. Uh, Skull and Bones scares me. You know, more than Freemasons. I mean, here's a group that may have been an Illuminati lodge initially. There is enough documentation to suggest that the person who founded Skull and Bones was a member of the Illuminati in Europe. Um, there's some documentation, and we're still working on really proving that. But Skull and Bones um, only initiates, I believe it's 16 people per year, which means that in a given century, you're only going to have at most 1,000, you know, 600 people alive who are Skull and Bones members. That's a very small percentage of the population. And yet, uh, a couple of years ago, we had John Kerry and George Bush both running for president as the heads of their respective parties, and both were members of Skull and Bones. What are the odds of that? Mm. They're astronomical. You know, I mean, with, with 0.00001% of the population is a member of Skull and Bones, mm. to have two of them running for president at the same time, uh, you have to sit, and they won't talk about it. Yeah. They will not discuss their membership. These things bother me, you know. Yeah. These things bother me. I don't care if it, my neighbor is a member of Skull and Bones and won't talk about it. But if I'm voting for someone for president, you know, I need to know what their agenda is. Of course, yeah, yeah. And, and where, where their allegiance stand. Exactly. And if, if your allegiance is so strong to Skull and Bones, you will not discuss Skull and Bones because of the oath you took. Does that mean that your oath as the president to defend the Constitution and the United States, et cetera, et cetera, is less somehow of your oath to Skull and Bones? Uh, this has always bothered me, as religious affiliations always concern me about presidential candidates and politicians. Mm -hmm. I'm very concerned about that. I mean, Ronald Reagan, you know.